Hey everyone, and welcome to my review for House of the Dragon Season 2 Episode 3, The Burning Mill. Okay, so I thought a lot of this episode was great. Unfortunately, there was also a lot I struggled to enjoy. I think I might have been extra disappointed this week because Episode 2 was amazing and this felt like a real step backwards. Don't get me wrong, this is a very high quality show, so there's always far more good than bad. But for me, that ending was hard to watch and literally left me shaking my head when the credits rolled. But before getting into all that, let's start like always with the positives before moving on to negatives, my top 5 moments and a final score. Now for the positives, like every episode so far this season, we'll start with the opening scene. For me, this show has nailed every opening and this was no exception. The rivalry between House Blackwood and Bracken is one of my favorite storylines from all the books, including their participation in the Dance of the Dragons, which began a little differently from what was shown in the episode, but was still done very well, and had such a big impact on me I actually yelled out in happiness when the scene began and I recognized what was happening. I'll talk more about it during my top 5 moments, so for now I'll just say the episode started very strong. The next scene I enjoyed was Kristen Cole's introduction as Hand of the King. The small council meeting in general was very interesting as I liked seeing him present their plans to turn the crown lands and grow their army. With Aegon desperately trying to convince others and himself, he's a great leader and a warrior on par with his namesake Aegon the Conqueror. Which is why I also loved when he donned that impressive armor which looked so uncomfortable on him. I also thought it was hilarious he named his friends to the Kingsguard and the mockery they've made of such an honored position. Which again brings it back to Kristen Cole, who's failed miserably as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, just like he's failed at everything in his life that didn't involve swinging a sword. But circumstances meant he continued to get promoted to the point where he now serves as Hand of the King while having no knowledge or ability to lead in this way. The massive difference between him and Otto was so evident during the small council scene, as I could easily imagine Otto being the first to speak, taking charge and setting the agenda, while Kristen arrived late, sat down and said nothing, waiting for others to lead the discussion, then joining in only when it directly dealt with matters of combat. Great scene and performances from everyone. Moving to Dragonstone, I actually kind of enjoyed the scene between Mazaria and Rhaenyra this week. Although I'm still not thrilled with the Mazaria character, at least she's now asked for a place at court and is starting to show a little ambition, though she's still far from the cunning badass I was hoping for. The Valerions on the other hand have proven far more interesting to me, as I've really enjoyed their portrayal on the show. Spoilers here, but one thing I'm really liking is the emerging plotline between Corlys and his bastard sons Adam and Alan. From the conversation he had with Rhaenys this episode, where he's delaying his choice for heir to Driftmark, to me it seems like he's already thinking about legitimizing Adam and Alan, as they're proven sailors and shipwrights with a love for the sea who might safeguard Driftmark and ensure the prosperity of their house while more properly continuing the Valerian bloodline. But of course, the big obstacle to this is his wife, who can't know the truth because she'll probably feed him to her dragon. But since it looks like next week will be the Battle of Rook's Rest, her death means she's never gonna find out and so while Corlys will be devastated, he'll also have the freedom to enact his plan. Returning to the capital, it was hard to watch the sincere humiliation being dished out by Aegon to his brother Aemon, which was so meaningful in a really sad way. I think what I liked most was that none of Aegon's friends reacted or laughed at the mockery. They instead looked horribly uncomfortable and tried to look away. Pretty much everyone except Aegon understands what a horrifyingly dangerous man Aemon Targaryen truly is, and how if he's ever pushed too far, the consequences could be catastrophic. Despite all the horrible things he's done, it's hard not to feel a little bad for Aemon who's clearly dealing with massive trauma from his childhood. The last thing I want to mention here is Jacaris Targaryen, who was in no way a big part of this episode. But even so, I loved his attitude and body language cause he just seemed so disillusioned with his mother's indecision. He is clearly a sharp, clever boy who can see she's failing in her duty, but because he's also dutiful and honorable can say nothing as to not contradict or go against his mother. Spoilers again, but since we know what's gonna happen to him, I suspect his pent up desperation to fight will translate into some overly aggressive battle tactics that ultimately cost him his life. Now moving on to the negatives, for me there's really only one thing to discuss and that's how disappointed I was with Rhaenyra's reasoning and decisions in this episode. At the end of season 1, when Lucerys was killed, she had a look on her face that made me think the Dragon Queen was ready for war. But 3 episodes later and she's still wrestling with her conscience about an inevitability and trying to stop something that's already started. 
obviously peace is preferable to war, and she's absolutely right to be concerned that this war in particular will be extra brutal because of their dragons. But what everyone except her and Rhaenys seem to understand is that peace is no longer an option. There was a 0% chance her plan would work. The lines are drawn, battles have begun and armies are on the move, but she continues to defy all advice and common sense. Up until the very last moment of the last scene, she outright refused to accept reality, and it really made her seem like she's not up to the job of ruling a kingdom in wartime. In peacetime, I still think she could have been a good ruler, as she clearly has a kind and merciful heart which might serve the realm and common folk well. But so far, she lacks the ability to make that switch into a more focused and warlike mentality. And the thing is, she actually could have peace at any moment by simply surrendering to Aegon. But she's obviously not going to do that, so I just could not understand the logic of anything she was saying or doing this episode. Which then leads us to the ending, where Rhaenyra infiltrates the capital to speak with Alicent Hightower about averting the war. For me, this was a real low point in the series. So utterly silly, I just found myself shaking my head for the entirety of the scene. I really couldn't believe the direction they went. Not only were Rhaenyra's actions horribly reckless, thoughtless, and irresponsible by risking her capture or death, but then Alicent just let her go, instead of running out at the first opportunity and screaming at the top of her lungs, which in a few moments might have ended the war and secured her son's throne. They both acted so illogically and unreasonable. The only positive I can really talk about here is that it was nice seeing Alicent realize the mistake she made with her husband's last words. But as she told Rhaenyra, it doesn't matter anymore. Alicent finally explained what everyone else already knew and what should have been obvious to Rhaenyra, that there was no going back and that war was the only path forward. Although I really did not like this scene, I do hope it at least forces Rhaenyra to accept reality and conduct herself as a proper leader. I've been a big fan of her character in this show, as even with all her flaws, I felt she would be a good queen. But for me, this episode really hurt her credibility. Now let's move on to my top 5 moments, starting with number 5, which was the introduction to Alice Rivers of Harrenhal. From the moment she walked onto the screen, I knew exactly who she was and am so excited to see what they do with her character. In the books, Alice Rivers is a bastard daughter of House Strong, possibly fathered by Lord Laris Strong. She was an older serving woman and wet nurse, possibly in her 40s, though she appeared far younger. According to some, she was a woods witch or an enchantress, while others say she was simply good with potions. But whatever the case, she had a fascinating life. Some more spoilers here, but not only did she become the bedmate to Daemon Targaryen, she later became the alleged wife of Aemon Targaryen and had his son. Her story gets even more interesting after the war, as she gathered an army of outlaws to rule as Witch Queen of Harrenhal, using her army and possibly magic to defend her claim. It was really cool seeing her character, and hearing her predict Daemon's death was especially impactful. At the number 4 spot, we stay in the Riverlands with King Daemon's bloodless conquest of Harrenhal and the capitulation of Simon Strong, who quickly became one of my favorite characters in the show. He masterfully handled that entire situation, brilliantly saving the life of his family and people. He even showed a different kind of courage by being strong in submission, being active and taking charge of the situation, bending the knee without hesitation, inviting Daemon to eat, treating him respectfully but casually, as if they're already friends. It was also nice to hear they know the truth of Laris killing his father and brother. Aside from Laris, pretty much every strong on this show has been very likable and that seems to be continuing. Caraxes also looked amazing when he landed on the tower. For the third best moment of the night, we go to Bela on Moondancer chasing down Sir Criston, Sir Gwyn and their men. What a badass scene. I've really been enjoying Bela and Reyna in this show and liked both of their moments in this episode. It would have been nice to spend more time with Reyna, but she was given a pretty incredible mission and opportunity which was cool to see. That part is a little different from the books, so I'm curious how they're going to deal with the consequences of that voyage across the sea. But the real standout this time was Bela seeing that great chase scene where the greens barely escaped with their lives. I also enjoyed Gwen Hightower in this episode as an elitist nobleman from the Reach looking down on the up-jumped Dornishman. For the second best moment of the night, I want to talk about the great scene with Ulf the White describing his dragon seed lineage as the bastard son of Balon the Brave and half-brother of King Viserys, which is why he claims loyalty to his niece Queen Rhaenyra. 
Regardless of whether this is true, it's awesome seeing him peddle the story for drinks and hilarious when Aegon walked in and he flipped completely, yelling out for the king. Hugh Hammer and Ulf the White came off so despicable in the books, it's kind of amazing seeing how charming and likable they are in the show. And finally for the best moment of the night, I go back to the beginning with the Battle of the Burning Mill. This was by far my favorite moment of the episode. Of course I wish they could have dedicated more time to the Blackwoods and Brackens, but given their limitations I felt they did a great job, and that haunting shot of all the bodies was such a strong way to start the episode. In the books, things go a bit differently as the hostilities begin when Lord Samuel Blackwood starts raiding Bracken lands, prompting a response from Sir Amos Bracken, the son of Lord Humphrey Bracken, who marched his army against House Blackwood. But the enemy was ready for their advance and launched a surprise attack while the Brackens camped at a mill by the Red Fork River. Having won their duel years earlier, Sir Amos Bracken again defeated Lord Samuel Blackwood, striking him down in single combat. But Sir Amos was then killed by a werewood arrow fired from the bow of 16-year-old Alison Black Alley Blackwood, a sister to the slain lord who went on to play an important role in the war going forward. All that would have been great to see, but given that they had to crunch everything into a single scene, I felt the visuals were powerful enough to make it stand out, and seeing the burning mill in the background left a lasting impression. So that's my review for House of the Dragon Season 2 Episode 3, The Burning Mill. Unfortunately, after the greatness of last week, for me this felt like a weaker episode. Of course, a weak episode for House of the Dragon is still really good, with great acting, dialogue, set designs, wardrobe, music, and everything else. So I'll still give the episode a respectable score of 7 out of 10, but it just couldn't reach that higher level for me. But what did you all think? Did you like the episode? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to come back for my next review along with the Dance of the Dragons themed videos released every Sunday. So that's it for now guys, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. A special thanks to all those who contribute to Civilization X, like Ishmam Ahmed of Shamidiana, Sir Bob of the Bowie, Tim, and Torque Frostbite. If you'd like to help the channel, be sure to give a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and click on the links below, or else go to patreon.com slash civilizationx, where you can gain early access to videos, vote on future content, and watch the Patreon-only series, Heroes of Lore and Legend.